You guys hot, cold? What is, what is everybody? Hot, that's good. Uh, I'd love to hear that because um, I don't have to feel guilty. Joseph, can you bump the air down one degree? So um, I don't have to, because I had a feeling it's going to get a little sweaty today, and I'm trying to save you, actually. So um, if anyone said cold, I did not hear you. Um, I still did not hear you. Uh, some of you would rather be comfortable and watch me sweat. Um, that's just, uh, that one I can take. Um, all right, so Dan's had a crazy week. I've had a crazy week, busy week. Uh, anybody else craziness this week? Yeah, okay, I'm not alone. That's good. Um, I, I don't know if that's good, actually, but it made me feel better. Um, so last Saturday, we were, I, I was at something called Lead Day for the district pastors, where they bring in some speakers and kind of pastor pastors. You know, you spend so much time alone and, and preaching and teaching and leading, and you don't really have a whole lot of people pouring into your life. So they set this up for all the pastors to come, and it, it was amazing, and then Saturday night, we drove back. I drove back here. Sunday morning, I was with you all. Anthony preached a, a pretty solid sermon on uh, do not judge. I was blessed by that. I was able to worship with you. Amy and I drove back to Joplin on Sunday night. We had a, our district assembly for the Church of the Nazarene, so that's southwest Missouri, southeast Kansas. God is moving in southeast Missouri and south, southeast Kansas, southwest Missouri, so we're a, small di- we're a small district, population-wise. We don't have a major metropolitan area. But the, the Lord saved 1,047 people in, in our district last year. So he is, he is working, yes. It, it, it's amazing, actually. Um, Springfield is our largest city. Um, and, and that was second in the country. So major metro areas like Chicago and L.A. And, and so God is moving here in Missouri and at the lake, um, believe it or not. So Sunday night was great. Monday was a great day. We were still at District Assembly. So Chris Zimmerman came in from Germany. He's kind of the create. He launched the first communities on mission in Frankfurt, Germany. So dealing with a, a kind of a post-Christian culture. He wanted to, to find a way to reach people with the love of Jesus that just aren't coming to church. So he, he, he kind of piloted that, and he came and taught us a little bit on that, and it was a really good time. Ken and Rita were there for that as well. Um, then Monday night, we have our ordination service, so, and that is a special, special night. So it's, it's celebrating the men and women God has called into vocational ministry and their ordination, and it's a special time, and it was great. Tuesday, we had our, our International Missions Convention, and uh, Amy told me earlier in the week, this is the, that's going to be the best day of the week. And I'm like, no, it's not ordination. It was the best day of the week. So much like Dan, like we should know by now to listen to our wives. They are smarter than us. Seems like they have the Holy Spirit at least way more often than we do. So, um, but it was the best day of the week and God spoke and, and he moved and I was just broken and I was crying. And I used to say I'm not a, a crier, but that's proving to be true. The older, I don't know other guys, the older you get, does it become easier to cry? Cowards. <laughs> um, but it does, it just becomes easier. More things move you, I guess. I don't know as your, your days become more and more numbered or your awareness becomes stronger. Those things move you. But you know, Tuesday night, we're driving home Tuesday evening and you get the call that no parent wants to get um, from your 17-year-old son says, Dad, uh, so calm. He is, he is so calm. He says, Dad, I've been in an accident, and I've totaled the car. <laughs> and this felt like a joke in some ways. I'm like, ah, you should have a better delivery if you're going to joke, right? Um, but it's the call you don't want to get. I said, well, you're, are you okay? Yeah, he's okay. And then, so we... Do our best to deal with that, running around with cars. And you guys have been so gracious, people offering up cars and prayers and just loving on our family well. 
Um, Wednesday, we're in Springfield. Amy's kind of starting a new season in her life, and we're kind of checking that out. She's not moving to Springfield. Um, but uh, so we were in Springfield all day, and then Wednesday night I get a call or, or a text message from the, the district superintendent. And he says, hey, I'll see you guys at the summit tomorrow. And I'm like, what is the summit? Uh, where am I supposed to be tomorrow? And I rack my brain, and I start searching my emails like, Jason, you idiot, you ignored an email. Uh, now you're supposed to be somewhere tomorrow. You have no idea where it is or what it's for. And, and I said, I'm going to have to call him. And I saw a call him. I say, Phil, uh, at the risk of, sound, of sounding like an idiot and probably for not the last time, what is the summit and why am I going and when do I need to be there? And anyway, it's this event so that we have about 100 churches and there's like 10 of us that lead those 100 with one district superintendent. And it's a global leadership summit. And it was amazing. It was in back in Joplin. So I was back in Joplin Thursday and Friday. But Thursday morning, Thursday morning, I went to bed Wednesday night. I set my alarm for five, I thought. Uh, so we only have two cars at this point, And there's four of us driving. And I, I had to drive the church van. And, and rather than coming here Wednesday night and getting the church van, we were going to wait until... Thursday morning, but I woke up at 6.35, and I needed to leave at 6 a.m., and I kind of got all in my feelings, if I'm honest, like I was like, feeling really bad about myself, and I'm like, you don't belong in this room anyway. All these guys are pastoring big churches, and this is maybe God working, and Amy, God bless her, was so supportive. She said, oh, no, you do. You need to go. You need to be, you just need to go. They'll understand you're never late for anything, and I'm not. And I'm just kind of pouting, if I'm honest. Like, I'm not going. I'm going to take my ball and go home. They should have given me more notice. Like, all of these things. And I sat down on the couch with John, and I said, John, would you go late? He's like, well, yeah, I'm not going to not show up, Dad. I said, oh, wow, yeah, you're, you're right. So I went, and we were blessed. Gosh, so all these like global business leaders who were Christians and pastors and spoke into us and finally got back Friday night from that and Saturday here at Men's Breakfast, which was great. Saturday afternoon, we went and bought Amy a new car, which was awesome. So Amy's never had a new car in her life. So, uh, and, and it's modest. It's a Kia. Don't think you're paying me too much, okay? <laughs> it is a Kia, we wrecked a Kia, we bought a Kia. We're not getting fancy here. It's not a Mercedes. But it's been a crazy week. Just nuts. It's, I mean, two nights in my own bed and just everywhere. And it feels like chaos. And, and honestly, that's good for me. Uh, too much time in my own head is not always good, but pretty busy. But I see the hand of God on it every step of the way. I saw the hand of God when John went off the road. And did not have a scratch on him. He hit two trees. He managed to hit two trees on both sides of his car. I don't know if that's talent. Uh, but God's hand was on it. He did not suffer a scratch. And he's a pretty resilient guy, I think. We will see. But um, I see God's hand on everything. I, I see God's hand working through my wife when I just want to pout and working through that same son saying, Dad, show up. You've taught me this my whole life. Show up. God's hand was on all of this. And, and, and in the midst of that, I also see the devil trying to get a foothold. I see the devil trying to distract me from the work God has called me to. And he's so good at it, isn't he? He's trying to get me to stray, but God is so faithful to restore us if we allow him to. He is so faithful. The evil one tries so hard to distract us with the world that we love so much. He tries so hard and he's so good about it, Go so good at it. So I'd ask you, what about you? Is God, is the devil trying to distract you from the life God has called you to? If you look at your life, and you're honest, if you just sit back and take a moment and look, how is the devil working to distract you from your kingdom calling? Where is he working? 
And he finds the place that we are weak. So it might be with my kids. It might be with our money. It might be with our spouse, relationship, job, the place we are weak. And he doesn't come and just cut off your arm. No, he pricks a hole in your heart and it just kind of starts to drift. Your heart starts to drift. He finds that weak spot and he exploits it. And let, let's think about that with John's wreck. And John, I am sorry, son. But you're a pastor's kid, and this very well might be your kingdom calling this week. Um, but, but his wreck. So, so once I knew he was okay, I did the dad thing, and I said, oh, in my head, and maybe out loud to Amy, I said he was either speeding or he was on his phone. I know he was. So we hung up. I was nice. Just a small chance I was wrong. I did not want to jump on him. Um, but so I got on Live 360, and I see, well, he's driving 38 and a 35. Not real reckless, right? Not, I mean, I, I've driven much faster than that on that road. Um, and he said, well, no, I wasn't on my phone. And, and I believed him. Um, here's the thing, though. He was distracted, though. And he was distracted in an area that was weak to him. So John, the thing that makes him special and the thing that can really hurt him is his perfectionism, his ability to do really hard things that most people can't do. And this really high standard that he holds for himself and this self-discipline that most 17-year-olds don't have. But it can also drive him crazy because that is an endless pursuit of perfection. And John, is, as he's leaving, he's the, the battalion commander for JROTC, and he wants things to go so well. And he's thinking about this kid that didn't show up to practice, who he cares about, but he also expects to be a leader and show up and do the right thing. And the kid doesn't show up, and it's driving John crazy. And that what, what began as a puncture has blown open into a hole, and it's now controlling his mind. And he gets distracted with that. One tire slips off the curb. Pier 31 Road, it's, he's leaving work. It's six-inch curb. One tire slips off. He, all of a sudden, he's aware. He goes to overcorrect, does inexperienced driving things, comes back, goes all the way down the hill. Bam, bam. That's the end of the, the Kia uh, as we knew it. Um, but, but John was distracted by things that weren't meant for him and that he couldn't control. And he got off the road that could have led to destruction if not for God's grace. And Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount is, is kind of doing this the entire time. He is trying to keep us from ourselves. You think about, even in the Beatitudes, he, he, he gives us the posture of what it means to live in the kingdom. It means what it means to, to live a life that's serving God. And, and he says... Blessed are the poor in spirit. We're not haughty. We don't think a lot of ourselves. We're poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn for their own depravity, but also the lostness and brokenness in our world. Blessed are those with a pure heart. Blessed are those who search, seek righteousness. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. We, we're not fighters. That's not what the kingdom life is. We're not fighting with everyone. No, we're making peace. That's who we are. And if that's not what you're doing, you're getting off the path. And you're, you're slowly drifting into a path that leads to destruction. Not only eternally, but here on earth. That leads to destruction. And he says, this is what it looks like to follow me. And, and you are salt and, and you are light. And that's what this looks like. Anything other than that, you're, you're getting off base. And I'm going to show you this and. 800 different ways, but I'm going to say the same thing. This is the narrow path. And, 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 and he does this out of love. And he says, so you are the salt of the earth. And if, and if the salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing, right? So that's why he's telling us that is so we can stay salty and stay focused on Jesus. So he's not, do all of these rules aren't, aren't to, to rob us of joy. They are to give us joy to, on the only path that brings any joy, and that is Jesus. And, you know, he goes on on this same, saying the same thing. He says, I don't, don't think for a minute that I came to abolish the law. No, no, no. 
But I came to show you what it's supposed to do. And that is establish and maintain relationship with me. So you've heard do not murder and don't murder. But also don't let anger stew in your heart. Because you're getting off the road. Your eyes are drifting. Get back on me and turn the other cheek. And if someone asks you for your shirt, give them your coat also. And all of these different things. And love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Because that is the narrow way that leads to eternal life that starts today. So Jesus does this over and over and over. And and he knows how dense we are. We are dense. So he tells us the same thing in 10 different ways, but don't mistake it. It is the gospel. And you move into chapter 6. And he says, when you give to the needy, don't do it where everyone can see it and glorify you because that's your reward. No, do it in secret and your father who sees will reward you. And when you pray, don't stand on the street corner for everyone to hear you and see how righteous you are. No, that's not who we are. That's not the narrow path. That's the path of the world. No, no, no. Come back here and pray in secret. And I will hear you and pray this way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Holy be your name, God. So he tells us all of this to keep us on the path, folks. He doesn't want us to drift. He cares for us. And he wants to sustain your joy. And that's why he gives us all of these guardrails that Pastor Grant used to like to say. To keep us right back on the path we're supposed to be on. And then he says, do not store up your treasure in heaven. Why? Because he doesn't want us to have stuff? No. But because it will take you off the path he has called you to if you would allow it to. We chase shiny things. For some of us, that's money. And he says, do not worry because you seek the kingdom and I will take care of you. Stay on this path and you do not have to worry. And that is a promise because you were built for relationship with God. Don't chase all this that is going to leave you empty and wondering and drifting. No, no, no. Come back here. Lock eyes with me. And follow me in the kingdom of God. So all of these things are to keep us in fellowship and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we talk about this kingdom life. This is what keeps us in the kingdom and keeps us in fellowship with God. I don't know if you've ever drifted. Maybe I'm the only one. But it starts slow, doesn't it? You take one step off the path and that next step's a little easier And that next step is even easier than that. And before you know it, you have no relationship and no fellowship with the Father at all. And he does not want that for you. In chapter 6, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body, and if the eye is unhealthy, you won't have any light. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. What you'll have is darkness, and you'll think it's light. You'll drift so far that you'll think it is light, but it's really darkness. And then he goes into chapter 7, and Anthony did a really good job last week of kind of breaking that down. But he says, hey, do not judge others, right? And what he's saying is do not become judgmental. Don't have that offended spirit, that quarrelsome spirit Are we guilty of that, folks, in 2023 in America? We we are a bunch of snowflakes, right? All of us. We're so easily offended. And and like Anthony touched on it last week, it leads us to this whataboutism. And someone will say like, oh, so-and-so does this, or, or you do this, or you're doing this, or you're making me feel this way, and our immediate reaction is to say, Well, what about what you did? So we walk around with this posture that is defensive. defensive, And we judge and we just walk around with this chip on our shoulder. And and, and 
Here's what it does. It takes us away from the path God has called us to. And, he, and Jesus kind of touches on that. He said, hey, don't take something which is set apart and holy, which is you, and throw it, the pearls, amongst swine or amongst dogs. That this is holy and you're drifting off the path and it's going to devour you. This isn't who we are. We don't judge one another. This is going to destroy you, which is exactly the opposite of what I'm calling you into. So this whole time he's telling us, like, stay. I want to see your eyes, John. I want to see your eyes, Talon. Keep your eyes focused on me. And all of these other things, they're going to distract you from the kingdom calling I have on your life which is the only thing that is going to fulfill you. It is the only thing that is going to bring you peace and joy in your life. And we are such a distracted people, and this is a busy world. And this takes a little effort on our end, but God is faithful to restore relationship. If you have drifted from relationship this morning, he is faithful to restore. He is a waiting father. So all of this in the Sermon on the Mount is doing the same thing. Keeping us from destruction is what Jesus is trying to do. Because he gave the Israelites the law, and it didn't work because they didn't understand the heart of it. They didn't understand that at the heart of it was relationship. So they got good at following rules and creating rules to circumvent rules and do all the things we do, because that's we're good at that, but... At the heart of it was relationship. So when Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it, but fulfill it, he's fulfilling it to relationship with his children, to reconcile his people to himself. Jesus is the God who leaves the 99 and grabs the one and throws it on his shoulder and carries it back in. That is why he is here, is for a relationship with you and relationship with our world. So as we read the Sermon on the Mount, Does it rebuke us? Yes. But it's to restore relationship with God. And and what do we do with that? It just so happens Jesus has something to say about that. Matthew 7, 7. We're following the passage that Anthony preached from last week where he says, hey, don't judge because you'll be judged by the same standard. First, remove the log from your eye before you go and try to do surgery on someone else's. Don't throw what's holy to swine or dogs. So he gives them a, a, this thing of what not to do. And as, as he always does, he says, hey, don't do this. And now he's going to tell us what to do. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So this text is one of the favorite texts for false prophets. This is the prosperity gospel. This is name it and claim it. Paul Washer says, uh, blab it and grab it. Uh, but this, this, this is preached a lot that way as you ask for a Mercedes and God doesn't give you a Kia, he gives you a Mercedes. But, but we know that can't be true. You can't divorce this passage from the rest of Scripture. You can't divorce this passage from the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. One chapter ago, he said, hey, don't store up treasures for yourself here. Don't worry about that stuff at all and I'm going to provide. So this is not a prosperity gospel, um, faith healing chapter. That's not what it is. And we have to go back to chapter 6. And what does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God, right? Seek first the kingdom. So that is our posture on any of this. Seek first the kingdom and then come to me. Ask with the kingdom in mind and I will answer. Seek my kingdom. Seek me and you will find me. Keep knocking on the door and it will be open to you. 
But that is with the kingdom in mind. 100%. And, and it's hard. It is hard. This is a hard passage, and it can be confusing. But seek first the kingdom. If we keep that top of mind and we have that goal, God answers prayer. And he, he goes on to the next, next passage here. And I'm sweating even though it's not that hot. Oh, got two shirts on. We'll see if I sweat through them both. Um, but he says, which of you, if your son asks you for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, that's convicting, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God is for your good, right? We see that in the the complete narrative of Scripture. So if rather than argue and fight and judge... We are to come back to him, seek his kingdom, and ask him, and keep knocking on the door. We should be able to take him at his word. That he is a good father who gives good gifts to his children. Here's the caveat. He's going to give you what you need. He may not give you what you want. And sometimes what he gives you feels like judgment, but it is in fact mercy. So we may ask for something, and he may give us something different. But you can take him at his word that that is for your good. So as you seek him, and as you knock, and as you ask, and you receive, You can sit back and say, all right, this is what I've got. How is this for the good of the kingdom and the good of me? But there are so many times where God's mercy just feels like judgment for a moment. But the truth is, sometimes we ask for a snake and he gives us a fish. And sometimes our hearts are not right and he gives us what we need to make them right. Because his goal is for relationship. His goal is not for your prosperity necessarily or your safety or your comfort. His goal is for your relationship with him. And he goes back in verse 12 and he says, So in everything, do what you would ha- do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. The golden rule, right? We all love this. We grew up. No, I didn't know any of the Bible. I knew the golden rule. I only, it, it was really only a, a used to scold me, though, when I didn't do this. It was never taught to me as a way to live. So if I instigate, I, I was kind of an instigator growing up. Um, yeah, just, it, it, it hasn't left me, but it, it's lessened. Um, but so I would instigate something, and that's what my mom would use. Like, um, the golden rule, Jason, would you want him to do that to you? No, mom. So it was kind of a scolding. But do you see what Jesus did here? And this is really cool. Love God. You go back to chapter 7. Ask, seek, knock. Seek his face. Honor him. Seek first the kingdom. Love him with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus will say it 30 different ways, but it's the gospel. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the entirety of the law and the prophets. So remember, this came right after. Do not judge. Don't get in that. Don't take what is holy and I've set you apart for. Don't take your kingdom calling and and throw it into this nonsense that you can't control. Instead, get back to me, Jason. Eyes up here. Ask, seek, knock. And then go and love others like you would have them love you. That is the entirety of the gospel, folks. 
That is what Jesus preaches, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of heaven has come near, and I want you to be a part of it. That is a special calling. The kingdom of heaven has come near now on earth. The kingdom of heaven is near. And I want you guys, you incompetent group of misfits, to be part of it. And I am called to lead it. Wow. Because I feel more incompetent than any of you. And maybe that's the point. Don't get off the path. Get back here, Jason, because you can't do this by yourself. Eyes up here. This is the gospel. Love God with everything. Seek his kingdom first and then go and be a part of bringing heaven to earth at the lake community. That is, isn't that a special calling? And God is so good to us and he's so faithful. Sometimes he gives us a stick, a little shoulder tap. Now nah, get back in line, Jason. Don't get distracted, John, because I've got something better for you. So what, what can you do from here, like practically? Because I know this sounds great, and we want to build the kingdom. We want to follow Jesus. We want to be in relationship with God. But we're going to leave here, and in five minutes, we're going to eat lunch, and we're going to talk about something else, and we're going to forget it. And then tomorrow morning, it's going to feel so overwhelming, we don't have time for it. I, I preach this from experience. Can I encourage you to ask, seek, and knock intentionally in your life? Ask. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Ask God to reveal to you whether you are 17 or 75 or 57. With my gifts, God, with my station in life, with my influence, how can I further the kingdom of God? How can I bring heaven to earth here where you've called me? I encourage you to do that today, to set time aside and ask, to sit in his presence. And the truth is, we are all called to that. We are all called to bring heaven to earth, to give this world a glimpse of the light that can be with them forever. And God is out there setting the stage. He's setting up the room perfectly so when light comes in, everything is illuminated. He is doing the work. Be faithful to our call. And I don't know what it is. Some of you are in school. Some of you are getting ready to be in school. Some of us have jobs. Some of us are retired. Some of us are good looking. Some of us aren't. Some of us uh, are, 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 are natural speakers. Some of us are introverts. Some of us are both. Like, I don't know. You all have these giftings, these stations in life. Some of you have money. Some of you don't. God has placed you where you are to bring heaven to earth at the Lake Community. And then seek. So, so, so here's the caveat, and this is the thing we kind of struggle with. This is what makes it feel overwhelming. Seek first the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means to say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is my part in that? But that is paramount. That's right, Jay. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to practically make a kingdom plan for your life. Not five years from now. Some of you will not be here in five years. Some of you will move. Some of you will die. I mean, but one year, I think that's a reasonable goal. Ask God and make a practical kingdom plan for your life. And this isn't set in stone. God changes things all the time. God ever change anything on you? Once, uh, but one year, a one-year kingdom plan, and you just say this, 
one year from today, God, if I were to take the task seriously of playing my part in the kingdom of God, bringing heaven to earth, making disciples in the lake area, what would that look like? One year from now, if everything went perfectly, what would that look like? Yes. It would look like heaven. And be specific with this. We're so ineffective sometimes because we don't have our eyes on the prize. And has anyone ever blindfolded you and told you to walk a straight line? How well do we do that? We're one step in front of the other, and then by the time we make it 50 feet, we're 40 feet in this direction. Eyes on the prize. Kingdom come one year from today. What does that look like? And start to say, like, with my job, what does that look like? What do I need to do? Where I live, how I handle my money, what does that look like? And you're going to be surprised at what God does in your life. In light of the kingdom, what would all of these areas look like? And I encourage you to do this today because I know you will not do it tomorrow. And knock. Keep knocking. Tirelessly keep knocking. Day by day. Keep knocking. God, it's me again, Jason. Your idiot son. I'm back. Can't do this without you. I need your power. Because unlike me as a dad, he never stops appreciating our prayer. Keep knocking. Ask, seek, knock. So here's the challenge. Will you do this today? But there's a bigger challenge for many of us. We've drifted. We're way off the path, and I'm closing. We're way, way, way off the path. Some of us have darkness in it, and we think it's light. I believe God is calling you to restoration of relationship today. Whatever it is that's distracted you, it's that pinprick in your heart that has grown more than you ever thought it would. You're not here by accident. So I want to give you the opportunity today to ask him for restoration, to seek his face, to knock at the door that he is waiting to open. And for some of you, you may have never given your life to Jesus. You may have never surrendered your life to Christ. I believe today is the day for you. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want to give you the opportunity. If God is calling you to himself today, the altars are open. Father, you are so good, God. Jesus, you accomplished so much on the cross. You taught us so much in your life. Many of us, God, have drifted from relationship. Father, I pray today that you stir in the hearts of your children, God. Would you bring us back to where you've always wanted us to be? Might we lock eyes with you, Jesus? Might we put your kingdom first, God? And Father, we are praying that you use this group of men and women to bring heaven to earth here in the lake area. We love you, Lord. We praise the name of Jesus today. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. I ask you to just take a couple minutes and if God is moving on you, seek him today. Seek the restoration that he offers. Amen. God is good, right? Hey, I hope you all have a great week. I, I want to thank you for supporting the ministry here at New Life financially. Like, praise the Lord. 
We were over budget last month. I mean, that God is good. So, amen. Yeah, hey, we appreciate you supporting the ministry. Two ways to give. Offering box in the back, newlifeatthelake.com. I'm going to bless you guys and send you on your way. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. And may his face ever shine upon you. Go in peace and have a great week.